Here we go. Okay. All right. Good morning, Winwood. Good morning. Well, that was bright and lively. That was good. Uh, this morning, as we get started, I kind of want to bring a couple things uh, to your attention. Uh, tonight is the cantata, so I would encourage you guys, come on out. Uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be great. Come and celebrate uh, the risen Christ and, uh, and worship with us tonight. Um, also, if uh, you haven't lately checked uh, the, the mailboxes over there with Christmas cards in it, uh, they're really piling up, and so I would encourage you, come and see um, all the people that love you and, uh, and get those cards. So just a friendly reminder there. Um, this morning... Uh, as we open up our service in prayer, um, I would encourage you guys this morning, pray that God would renew your spirit, that God would encourage you this morning um, through our worship, through our time together, and through the study of God's word. And then uh, after that, I'll pray for us all, all right? Father, thank you so much for this great day that we get to come together and be the church and love you and worship you. Father, we pray this morning that your spirit would be with us in power. God, that you would encourage us, that you would guide us this morning, that we would see you for who you really are and the beauty of you. So, Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, let's get together and welcome our guests with one another, shall we? Can you hear me now? Good morning. Sorry for the delay. This morning we are lighting our Advent candle. Today our Advent candle lighters are Eleanor Faye Bennett and Bernice Rogers. 
Today we relight the first two candles of the Advent wreath, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. And now we will light the third candle of Advent. This is the candle of joy. As the coming of Jesus our Savior draws nearer, our joy builds with anticipation of his birth. From the book of Isaiah, we read the words of our Lord. Then be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. Isaiah 65, 18. From the New Testament, the words of Paul to the people of the Church of Galatia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and give thanks for fulfilling your promise of a Savior and what that means in our lives. Thank you for the gift of salvation through the birth of your Son, Jesus. Help us to see your glory and fill our lives with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand and join us as we celebrate our birth of our Christ. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And Christ was born. 
Let's pray for our offering. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Lord, you are good to us. And we come this morning to, to thank you for the many blessings that you have poured out and above all your son that you have given us that we may know you and be forgiven. Father, thank you so much. So Lord, we pray that this morning as we give these gifts back to you out of the blessings that you have poured out upon us, would you bless them for the glory of your kingdom? May they do more work than we ever could have imagined. Would you give us wisdom as we manage them and use them for your kingdom? Lord, we pray these things in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Awesome job. Well done. Thank you so much, choir, for leading us in worship this morning. If you guys want to see more of that, I would encourage you guys to come out tonight at 6. It is going to be a great time. Um, Before we get going, let's pray one last time, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for this morning. And Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with us this morning, that your spirit would guide us, that we would make these truths real, that you would remind us of them throughout the week. Father, may I speak on your behalf. May you give me the words to say that would edify your people, your church that you love, that you've died for. Father, I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, one of the things that I love to do as a, as a teacher and a, as a preacher is I love to speak about a big God. I love to tell people how great Christ is. I love for people to know how powerful he is, how wise, and how awesome our God truly is. And the crazy thing is, is that no matter how much I preach and teach that great truth of how awesome our God is, that he is greater than all the words that anybody will ever say about him. And I love talking about that because it, I hope it encourages us that as we pray and as we worship the true God, the King of Kings, that it helps us rely on him, that we can trust him, that as we pray and as we give things up to the Lord God Almighty, that you know what? It's in the right hands. God knows what he's doing. And I love preaching a big God, a powerful God. In fact, this, uh, lately I've been in, reading Isaiah in my quiet times. And I got to Isaiah chapter 10, and it talks about how awesome the Lord is and how he chooses what nations rise and what nations fall. He chooses where nations go and when nations should retreat. And we get that little, that peek behind the curtain It looks like mankind is in charge. It looks like these kings are ruling the world. But we get that peak, and we see it's truly the Lord of lords that's in control. It is the king of kings who is over all of them, and he is commanding them, and he is blessing them as he chooses or cursing as he chooses. And the Lord is in control. And, and, and I, I read Isaiah 10, and I love it. It's so good. And it's encouraging to me. But the interesting thing is a side effect of, of that is that as, as we focus on the greatness of our God and our King, is that sometimes it makes him seem distant. That... The Lord seems far away, and he seems disconnected from us. I'm like, man, God, you're, you're so great. You've got the, the whole universe that you're thinking about, and you're thinking about uh, these nations and kings, and, and you're making these big moves and these big plans. But, but, but God, do you, do you care about me, the individual? God, how do, you, how do you feel about what's going on in this world? It, it makes God seem disconnected. And so this morning... Uh, I want to let us know and remind us that yes, our God is awesome and great and powerful. But our God is so great and so awesome that he is also near and caring and loving and he is with us. And this morning we're talking about the miracle of Emmanuel. The miracle of God with us. The fact that, that God can relate to us that even though he is so great, and so powerful and awesome, just like Isaiah 10 proclaims. That even though that's going on, that the Lord is still cares about us individually, that he loves us, and that he provides for us, that he can relate to us. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14, says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold true to our confessions. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us. He can sympathize with our humanity. He can sympathize with our weakness. Why? Because God sent his son to be with us. Because God sent his son to be like us in human form. He he sent his son to be born as a human being. And because of that great gift, that great miracle of God with us, the miracle of Emmanuel, our Christ, the risen King, he could relate to us. And he can sympathize with us. He left heaven and he came to earth to be like a man and to go through human experiences and a human life. And because of that, the Lord can sympathize with us. That when we pray to him and we worship him, he's like, I've I've been there. I I know what you're going through. It's going to be okay. Here is grace, here is mercy. Because we're talking to somebody who's been there. We're talking to somebody who can relate to us. And so this morning we're going to go through Luke and a little bit of John. And we're going to look at those very human experiences that Christ went through. Those very human experiences that allow him to relate to us. And so like Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted with sin. So this morning we're going to go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And the Bible says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. For forty days, being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. Church, when we pray and when we worship God and when we read about him, we have a God who can relate to us because he was tempted just like us. Jesus and his humanity was tempted. He felt that pressure. He felt that tug between the two joys. Man, I I want to serve myself. I want to feel that pleasure and that joy that we get from sin. But at the same time, Jesus wanted to honor his Father and serve the Lord and to love him. And Jesus did just that. He did. He, He stayed pure. But he felt that temptation. He felt that tug. He felt that that back and forth. That, man, what am I going to do? This morning, I want you to know that when you pray to God and you're in that moment where you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with, with temptation, that you have a God who can relate to you. You have a little a Jesus who can sympathize with you. And he's felt that tug. He's felt those issues and those those questions and and as you maybe justify what's going on you try to justify what you're doing and what man i i really want this but you know that it's not right man our christ can sympathize with us and as we serve christ and as we love him we can look to his example because he's been there And we can see that, how did Christ handle temptation? How did the Lord Jesus deal with that that tug of of war, that back and forth? And I want you to know this morning that that Christ has been there. And that when you're going through those moments, that you can pray to a God who loves you. 
and cares about you. A God who doesn't go, oh, I can't believe you're struggling with that again. No, that is not our Jesus. No, we serve a Jesus who goes, that's okay, I love you. We're going to get through this together. Here is grace, here is mercy. I've been there, I've felt that. It's not worth it. We have a Jesus who loves us and cares about us. We have a Jesus who, his mercies are brand new every single day. We don't serve a God who, who adds everything up day after day. No. We serve a king who every single day, his mercies are brand new. At work, uh, it seems like there, there are some coworkers who every day they start in the hole. Every day there, there are people who are, who are on them, who are irritated with them already. They just got there. Why? Because everybody's remembering what they did the day before. And if we're honest, some days we're like that too, right? We, man, I can't believe you did that the other day. We're holding that against them, but that's not our God. That's not our King. The Bible says that the mercies of the Lord are brand new every day. And we serve a God who loves us, who can relate to us, who can sympathize with us because he's been there. He's been tempted just as we have. He's struggled just as we have. And then even though day after day we have those, those vices that come after us, and, it, and we pray, Lord, won't you just please take this away finally? Jesus says, I've been there. Here is grace and mercy. and We're going to get through this together. And so one of the first things that I want you to know is how can, how can God sympathize with me even though he's, he's so far away and he's so powerful and mighty, but yet the Bible says he can sympathize with me? That he can relate to me? How? Because Christ came as a child and was born, and he went through human experiences like temptation. And he's been there, and he's struggled with that. Another way that Jesus has experienced humanity and can relate to us is Jesus has been rejected. As we continue on in Luke chapter 4, we get to verse 16. Luke chapter 4, 16 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up, and he read. And Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah and he preaches a sermon and he cares about his people, these people who he's grown up with, who he's cared about, who he's been with his whole life. He's talking to them. He's telling them about the good news that salvation is coming, that the prophecies have been fulfilled. And how do the people react? Luke 4, 28. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and they drove him out of town and they brought him to the bro of a hill where, he had, where the town had been built so they could throw him down off of the cliff. But he passed through their midst and he went on his way. Jesus has suffered rejection. He has been there that, I mean, these people should love him. They should care about him. They, they've been there his whole life. They watched him grow up. They, they know he's a carpenter. He's probably worked for them. They've seen his handiwork. He's served them. He's loved them. These people have probably watched him. And how do these people react to his words? They reject him. They try to kill him. They want to throw him off a cliff. They drive him to the edge. And Jesus miraculously passes through them. That would have been a sweet sight to see. I want to know how he did it. But we don't have that information. But our Christ, our King, he's so powerful that even when man says, I want you to die, Jesus says, it's not my time yet. Just as the scriptures say, no one takes my life from me, but Christ says, I willingly lay it down. 
humans can't take his life, not till it's time. But he's so powerful, we get to see that glimpse. But in that same time where, where Jesus shows us his power and his might, you get to see that and he, he's felt like us. That in those times where we've been rejected or we've been pushed out or ostracized, man, Jesus can relate to that. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's at work. You know, that being a Christian has kind of pushed you on the outside because you don't do what everybody else does. You don't party or you don't drink and celebrate like everybody else does. So that pushes you away. You're, you're not normal and you're being rejected. Christ could relate to that. Maybe it's in their family that as, as being a Christian, people, people wonder, man, why are they so old school? Why do they, they hold on to these things, these beliefs? Why don't they grow and mature? You know, so maybe being a Christian in your family has caused you to be rejected. Or let's look at society, right? Maybe it's becoming more and more hostile to be a Bible-believing Christian than it ever has been. It is rough. The world seems to be after us. Everywhere we go, when we see Christians hold on to principles, the world comes at them. The world sues them. The world persecutes them. It's not a good place to be a Christian. And the truth is that when we pray, when we're in those moments, where God, where are you? I feel so alone. Jesus says, I'm right here. I've been there. I know what it feels like. I've been on the edge of a cliff by people who should love me, people who should care about me, who know me. And yet they still reject me. I've been there. And Christ says, don't worry. I love you. We're going to get through this together. Here is grace. And here is mercy. And so I want you to know this morning that, that as you feel that rejection, or maybe as you struggle with that loneliness of being out there and, and on the edge and on the border, Christ Almighty can relate to you. And when you pray to him and, you, and you're pouring your heart out because you're broken and alone, our God can sympathize with you because he sent his son to be born of a virgin, to be a human being, and to feel those human experiences. And Jesus has been rejected and pushed out just like we have been. That as we serve him and as we love him, the world pushes back and says, I don't want that. And so as, as we feel that rejection, Christ has also felt that rejection. Another very human experience uh, that Jesus has went through is Jesus has struggled with the will of God. Continues turning in your Bible to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 39. And the Bible says, He went out and went as it was custom to the Mount of Olives. The disciples followed him. And he came to the place and he said to them, Pray that you may not enter temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw away. He knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Have you ever struggled with God's will? Have you ever struggled with thinking, God, what are you doing? God, with all your power and all your wisdom and all your might, why is this happening? God, where are you? It feels like you're so distant. Why would, why would you let this happen? Have you ever struggled with God's will? Because in the humanity of Jesus, he sure did. He prayed, God, if there is another way, please let it be. 
Lord, let this cup pass from me. And as Jesus was thinking about all the pain that was coming, all the even more rejection, and all the pain that he was going to go through, and, and the fact that his his father was going to turn his back on him, and there was going to be a separation that he had never felt before, as the father turned his back on him, as he as he thought about all the his disciples and what they were going to go through, as they were scattered when their Christ was taken away, as he thought about all that, he said, "God." If there's another way, please let that happen. God, take this cup from me. Jesus has struggled with the will of God, just like we have. And I want you to know this morning that when you pray and you're in those moments where you you just don't understand that you are praying to Jesus who's been there, who has struggled with the same things, who has had the same questions, and in the end, he's had to submit. He's had to give it up and go, God, may not my will be done, but yours. I mean, in that moment, you can just hear it, that that in his humanity, Jesus doesn't go, oh, yeah, I get it. Oh, yeah, let's do this. No. No, Jesus goes, "I, I don't understand. But may your will be done. He's been there where he, he it just it seems like in his humanity when you read the text, he's not coming from a place of understanding. He's coming from a place of submission where he doesn't get it. He just goes, I don't know. But God, may your will be done and not my own. You ever been there? You ever been, ever been in that place? You're like, oh God, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand. It, it, see, I can think of a million different ways that this should go. There'll be a better plan. But here we are. Jesus, what are, you, what are you doing? You've been there. You struggled with God's will. You ever been in a place where you just had to go, I don't know. But God, I, I trust you. I read about your power. I read about your wisdom that nobody's ever taught you a lesson. That you are in control of all things. But okay. All right, I'll I submit. You've been there, so has Jesus. Jesus has been there. He's he struggled with God's will. And when we pray to him, and we're in that, that moment of weakness, that moment of, of humanity where we just don't understand, and we are praying to a God who says, I've been there. Because my son came to be with you, because my son came to be a human being, because of the miracle of Emmanuel, the miracle of God with us, the Lord can say, I've been there. And we have a Jesus who loves us, who comforts us, who can understand what we're going through. We serve a king who cares. And just as as we struggle with the will of God, so does so is Jesus. Jesus has been there in his humanity. He has struggled with the will of God. He's been to a place where he says, I don't know. But God may your will be done. And so the Lord this morning, he can relate to you that as you struggle and as you fight, and as you don't understand, and you're wrestling with the will of God, Jesus has been there. Another way that Jesus can relate to us is found in John chapter 11. As you continue to turn through your Bible, John chapter 11. And John chapter 11 says, starting at verse 32, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews 
who had come with her were also weeping, and they were deeply moved, and in his spirit Jesus was greatly troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, See how he loved him. Church, Jesus has grieved. The Lord Jesus has felt that pain of loss just like we have. And in those moments where you're alone and you're grieving and you're hurting, you pray and you worship a Christ who can relate to you. You pray to a Christ who can sympathize with you. You serve Jesus who has been there, who has lost friends people that he loved people that he cared about he has watched his loved ones grieve and cry I don't know what's worse the the, the feeling that I feel or, or watching my loved ones cry and there's nothing I can do about it and Jesus has been there he's watched the people that he loves cry and weep and go God where are you Jesus can relate to that pain, to that loss, and that grief, that darkness, and that sadness that as we go through the pain, Jesus has been there. Jesus has wept so much that people go, wow, he really loved Lazarus. He wept uncontrollably. He held Martha and Mary as they cried on his shoulders. And he's been there and he's comforted his friends and his family through that loss. He has been there in that very human experience where we lose our loved ones. Jesus has been there. Jesus can sympathize with that. He can sympathize with that loss and that pain and the grief. And so when we pray and we're just crying to Jesus because we don't know what else to do, we have a God who can relate, who can hug you and go, I've been there. It's okay, my child. We're going to get through this together. I love this passage so much because it just just shows the, the heart of Christ and how much he cares. Even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus, he still went through the pain. He felt it. He cried. He wept, Even though he knew it was going to be okay, that, Je- that Lazarus was coming back and that he was going to raise him up, man, Jesus wasn't heartless. He didn't say, what are you crying about? I'm right here. I'm going to make it all right. No. Jesus, he felt it. And he loved his people. And he loved Mary and Martha. And he cared so much for his friend that he lost. And he wept for him. Those uncontrollable tears that we weep. When we're in those moments of grief, Christ has been there. And he can relate to you. And you worship and you serve and you pray to a God who is not so far off that he cannot relate to you. No, we serve a high priest who can sympathize with you. Who can relate to you. Who can say, I've been there. We're going to get through this together. I felt that pain. I, I felt that loss. I've struggled with God's will. I've been rejected. I've been tempted. We're, we're, it's going to be all right. And so know this morning that our Christ has come and he has been there where we are. And he can sympathize with us. So now how does this apply to our life? I mean, I, I, I hope this, this changes everything for you. I hope this, this unlocks a new intimacy between you and God that as you pray and as you worship and as you serve and as you read, 
that God is more relatable than ever. That God is nearer to you than he's ever been in your life because you know that you are, are praying to a God who's been there, who can relate, who's felt that pain. And also because God can relate to us through his humanity, that means we also can relate to Christ in his humanity. That we can look at these passages in Luke and in John and go, how did, how did Jesus get through that human experience? How did Jesus deal with temptation? How did Jesus deal with rejection throughout his life? How did Jesus deal with struggling with God's will? How did Jesus deal with grief? How did he comfort those around him that he loved? And, we, and because of that, we can look to Christ to go, man, I, I, I could do that. I could follow that example. I could be like Jesus because he was like me in his humanity. He felt those things. And so this morning, as, as how can this apply to your life? You can relate to Christ. And you can look at him for his example, and you can figure out how to get through those very same issues, those things that Christ went through, that we've been through, that Jesus has been through. And so this morning, as, um, as we continue to, to worship and to pray and as we study, I hope that you feel closer to God than you've ever felt before. Because Christ is near, because Christ has been there. He's felt those things. And this morning, if you don't know this Jesus that I'm talking about, if you don't know this, this Jesus who can relate to you, who's been through all those things, will you please come and talk to me? Or this week, get a hold of me in the church? I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know this Jesus who loves you so much that he would leave heaven to come feel the human pain, the human experience, all the ups and downs. And so in this time of, of response, if you want to, please come talk to me. I'm here for you. Uh, or throughout this week, let's pray, shall we? Father God, we come before you humbled by your mercies, humbled by the miracle of Emmanuel, that you would leave heaven to be with us. So, Father, this morning we pray that you would continue to work on us. Father, may we draw near to you this week. And maybe throughout the week, may we remember how close and dear you are to us. Father God, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. The clouds of sin and sadness drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. For your gifts and for the mercies of Christ. And Father, we pray that throughout this time as we study the scriptures, and as we fellowship with one another, that we draw closer to you every hour. Father God, we praise things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.